Um, so first up, we have Jessica Ford. So um, uh, Jessica is currently at Facebook AI Research, but she's also um, um, a member of Project Jupiter. So her research focuses on the intersection between machine learning and open science. Very, very relevant to what we're talking about uh, in this school. Um, on Jupiter, she uh, she's built open source open source tools for reproducibility. Uh, very big uh, uh, open challenge in and any kind of applied machine learning or data analytics. Uh, she's worked as a machine learning researcher and data scientist in a variety of applications, including healthcare, energy, and human capital. So today we'll talk about promoting science in machine learning research with reprodu reproducibility. Thank you, Jessica. Anyway, uh, so I don't, I'm not necessarily committed to like having these slides, like, like going through these slides in this sort of format. Like we, this is a small enough group in which like, I am totally open with having you ask me questions. Like, you know, please raise your hand. Like, we can, we can, we can go backwards and forwards. Like, this is, um, this is a talk that I've given in the past, and I kind of want this to be to like serve your questions and needs. So, like, you know, we can ha have this be as like casual as we want it to be. Um, but any, but more broadly, I think like reproducibility is a really important question in the sciences in general. And I think there's a lot of really interesting that's been work been done in. Uh, the other sciences and in open source with regards to thinking of how we do reproducibility. Um, and machine learning has been thinking about this as well. Um, and my work kind of spans both of it. So this is some of the work that I've been working on um, and with colleagues also at other institutions such as Harvard and Facebook AI Research and Project Jupiter. Um, and so this is kind of a more general discussion of the area, but please like, honestly, like raise your hand, stop me, ask questions. This is going to be a not too technical talk, so it's totally like up for discussion. And I didn't necessarily set my thing to not freeze, so I apologize for that. Okay, so um, some of the challenges that we face in reproducibility and research is with the simple problem, which is how do we know what the state of the art is? Now, state of the art is particularly important in machine learning research because this is generally how we establish new baselines, new methods that are of particular uh, novelty. Um, but it's actually like, and it sounds like a pretty straightforward question, but it's a little more complicated um, as you will see in terms of how I think about this. So um, for state of the art, there are certain things people think about. Um, benchmarks and competitions are a really common way for people establishing state of the art. Um, who's seen papers with code? Who's familiar with papers with code? Uh, okay, so papers with code is a really great resource. Um, they have uh, tools for establishing state of the art for various um, benchmark sort of typical problems, often associated with particular data sets. Um, I, gen I generally think this is a pretty good resource. Um, so this is one example. Um, most many people are familiar with ImageNet as a data set. It also was a ch it's also a challenge problem. Um, so this is a really important uh, challenge that established uh, a lot of new developments in image classification. Um, who's worked with ImageNet data? Okay, a few people. Um, definitely look into it. I think it's a really important resource as well um, for the fundamental sort of problems in um, computer vision classification. Um, this is another example from colleagues of mine at Stanford. Don Bench is a benchmarking library um, that they, they work on as well. Um, Coda Lab has, is a tool for uh, reproducible research and for competitions. Um, a lot of work is being done in NLP in Coda Lab. Um, it's maintained by people at Microsoft. Uh, and so it sounds pretty straightforward. There's a lot of, this is typically what people do. They put up a competition, they put up a standard data, data set, and you know, if the task is pretty straightforward, it should seem relatively straightforward. But if you look actually into the machine learning literature, there's a lot of really interesting papers that have come out um, all, are all GANs created equal is one that focused on GANs. Um, attention is all you need is an NLP paper um, comparing methods as, as an uh, independent re-implementation. Um, on the state of the art evaluation of neural language models is another language paper. Um, and Deep Bayesian Bandit Showdown is another uh, Bandit's paper. Uh, and Deep RL That Matters is probably one of the more notable papers in terms of reproducibility um, in Deep RL. Oh, and this one also. Um, this is, again, another RL paper. So, you know, at least in, in, in terms of like these areas, GAN, language models, bandits, and deep RL, um, independent evaluations have found that uh, state-of-the-art isn't necessarily consistent 
for later papers and that like there isn't necessarily notable um, distinctions when other people independently re-implement re these models. Uh, additionally, there's, there's problems in terms of generalization and in machine learning, when we think about generalization, we often think about this in terms of how does a model perform um, after the fact on um, additional data that might be collected um, after, like from addition, a different data set. So um, we think about this. This is a paper from people down the road at UC Berkeley uh, looking at uh, CIFAR-10 and image, ImageNet data. And so they have, have pre-trained models on ImageNet or CIFAR-10. Um, these are standard data sets in the machine learning uh, image classification literature. And they uh, collect new data trying to use these sort of methods for data collection in as faithful a way as possible. And they find that uh, the performance isn't perfectly linear. I mean, it's like perfectly the same. So as a result, the accuracy ends up degrading. And so we don't necessarily have the same performance that we would expect on these classes on this data set that was collected at a different time, um, suggesting that learning isn't necessarily as generalizable as we would hope. Um, this is a paper in the reinforcement learning literature um, on how long it takes to, how many seeds does it take to, oh, this is a different one. This is um, a one with, um, when they change the domain to have additional noise. Um, and so generalization doesn't necessarily work when we change the actual um, input to our reinforcement learning model, such that these aren't, the models aren't necessarily robust to these kinds of interference. Um, this is another paper in the, the reinforcement learning literature in which the dynamics of the simulator are changed um, and uh, in, in this case, if you change the way this game of, um, is this is Amidar, um, in this game of Amidar, if you change how the dynamics of this game work such that the simulator changes in some way, you don't necessarily have the ability to play the game of Amidar as well. And so these questions around generalization have real world impact. Um, we will be hearing from Emily uh, in, a, in an hour or so. Um, and she will discuss this in more detail, but this is um, research from some colleagues of mine who were at Facebook. Um, and uh, this is um, images of athletes. Um, as you can see, um, you can kind of guess what these, uh, these sports that they play. So um, these, there's the people on the left are soccer players. Um, the people in the middle are hockey players. I think the, the people on the right are, are weightlifters. And you have some boxers and again some soccer players, um, but these classes are wrong. <laughs> right. Um, so this is an example of which generalization really does matter. Um, and I really think that like questions around like fairness and ethics often have to do with like fundamental problems in learning. Um, this is a really um, well cited study of um, commercially available implementations for facial recognition. Um, this is the gender shades paper. Um, I really, I strongly recommend this paper. This uh, study uh, studies how commercially available image recognition software um, performs on people relative to their gender and skin color. Um, they find that women of color um, are often misclassified um, at higher rates than um, the, rest of the, the rest of the faces in a data set. Um, this is a paper um, with colleagues of mine on um, hospital data, um, looking at um, trying to um, detect um, errors in uh, uh, like uh, radiology notes. And um, even though performance for a specific hospital looks very good, when you try to take this model and deploy it or to check performance on an on a external hospital, performance degrades. And you would think that for like notes on a similar domain, um, for radiology notes, you would get similar performance, but interestingly enough, the performance doesn't necessarily hold when you take this model and you apply it to data from a different hospital. Um, and this has actually led people in the explainability and interpretability literature to even question the, the use of these sorts of black box models for high stakes decisions. Um, and as a result, it leads us to really wonder, like, should we be using these, these black box deployments given their challenges and in situations in which like the, the decisions really do matter? Well, okay, so this, so this is the interesting case. Like it, it really, like at least in the fairness literature, people have argued that part of this problem is even just how this is measured. So when people are thinking about accuracy, they, it, it belies the, the distinctions in the distribution. 
So in the examples, you might say, okay, the performance is pretty good, um, and we aren't necessarily inspecting the errors, but the errors are not norm like are not like uniformly distributed and they're associated with certain cases, then this has like certain implications, right? So even if there is like better than human performance in a certain domain, it doesn't necessarily imply that the performance is as good as a human in general, right? So like superhuman performance that might not necessarily imply superhuman performance in certain cases, right? Does, does, that, does that make sense? I mean, so for example, like people, there's re recent work on um, various games. So like um, reinforcement learning is a really interesting domain. I mean, it really, I think this is like, this is the, what, I, what I'm trying to argue is that not only is this, like this is part of the tr problem is how we're framing evaluation. So when we say like, this is a particular classification task, we have like, this is the accuracy of people and like, we are exceeding that, we are exceeding the performance of people. That doesn't necessarily mean that like that, that, that will necessarily hold consistently. So even if you achieve superhuman performance on that given data set, it, there is evidence that suggests that this will not hold consistently for images in general collected of that type. So for example, you might be able to get really good performance on um, digit classification, um, but that performance does not necessarily hold when you now introduce it to new images um, of digit, handwritten digits that were not collected at that same time. So like slight distribution shifts do not necessarily lead to superhuman performance. No, I'm saying that some researchers have argued that this is, that, the, that this might, that we might not even be um, making the right decision in deploying back box models for high stakes decisions. That's what this author is arguing. Okay, um, any more questions while I'm here? Okay, so some, re some responses from the scientific community in machine learning. Um, this, who, who has seen this talk from NeurIPS? Very good talk. Uh, this, so this is the test of time. This is a, the, the text of a test of time talk from NeurIPS, I think 2017. Uh, really great talk um, by Ali Rahimi um, for a paper that him and Ben Recht wrote. Um, he's, ben Recht is also the author of this talk. Um, really great talk, strongly recommend it, um, which reminded the community of the importance of of experimental rigor um, and um, in, in rigor in terms of theory, rigor in evaluation. Uh, there are some additional papers that came out of the community. This is another paper um, by Lipton and Steinhardt on troubling practices in machine learning literature. Um, another paper out of Google. Uh, the iClear reproducibility challenge is a really exciting uh, uh, work in terms of encouraging re implementations and independent evaluation of. Uh, work coming out of the community at iClear. Uh, and IAS recently had another uh, seminar on um, deep learning, um, following up on the work of Ali Rahimi, in which he suggested, in which him and Ben Rack suggested um, that deep learning has become an alchemy um, and trying to promote better science within deep learning. Uh, this is another one actually about the National Academy of Science. So in response to this, um, I know there's a, there's a, Jan Lacun uh, typically argues that theory follows invention. And so that, you know, it might not necessarily be a concern that we don't necessarily have the theory because in many scientific domains, the science, um, the, sci the theoretical understanding of the phenomena that we observe is um, then documented after the fact. Um, and so it's an example of Boyle's pump. And so, you know, this is the kind of things that, uh, Jan is like citing. But I think more fundamentally, at least in terms of like machine learning research, then the question is then for machine learning researchers and people who are implementing machine learning models to understand things. Ultimately, are, are we scientists or are we engineers? Are we really fundamentally interested in um, building something and getting it to work or building something in order to create greater understanding? Uh, and so, like, I think this, I think in, in terms of understanding it, this sort of question, this has been something that's been debated for a while. Um, this is a quote on machine learning literature from 1988. Um, and um, I think it really suggests that people have been thinking about this problem for a while in the literature. Um, I think that um, fundamentally, we really need to understand 
when we create a machine learning model, um, what it op how it operates, and why is the behavior of these models performing in a certain way that it is. Interestingly enough, also, and again, I think we should all see this see this talk because it's a really useful talk. But um, interestingly enough, Boyle happened to also be an alchemist. So when we talk about these reproducibility, I mean, the one of the things that people often cite is Boyle's air pump. Um, Boyle also actually happened to be an alchemist. So anyway, um, but but I think really, when, in trying to square this problem fundamentally, I think regardless of whether or not we, we focus particularly on the engineering or on the science side, I think really ultimately when we are doing science with computation, and probably you all know this better than I do, um, ultimately we are computational scientists, right? We are scientists that ultimately use computation to try to understand the problem that we're trying to solve, um, and the computation serves this broader need of trying to gain knowledge. And so ultimately then, as all of you are, we are all then scientists who write software. Uh, and so to kind of dig into this sort of quote more, more deeply, then in the machine learning community at least, um, we need to think then about doing more than just beating benchmarks or trying things to get them to work. We really need to then do more careful study through empiricism and by running ex controlled experiments of the problem that we're trying to solve. So in this case then, if we're thinking about this, about reproducibility in the sciences, from a uh, computational science perspective, then reproducibility is ultimately a software problem. There's various definitions of reproducibility. People talk about reproducibility versus replicability versus repeatability. I generally am not one of these people who really wants to be very specific about um, what the, the definitions are. I want to focus more on what the problems are in the field in general that we need to, to deal with with regards to the relationship between the consistency of results and software. Um, and so I'm, I think for the rest of this talk, we're going to be focusing on um, reproducibility as a, fund, as a problem of software. So again, these definitions of reproducibility can vary. Um, and so in general, the problem I'm really interested in dealing with is going from the system specs you have, data, algorithm, hyperparameters, and your analysis to, like, cons to res the, con the results of one or more models. And so you have this sort of pipeline, and you want to be able to have relative confidence that this pipeline can work consistently, and the description of this, pi of this pipeline can be repeated. And so, as I mentioned earlier, repeat, uh, reaching consistent conclusions is particularly important then in this question of reproducibility as I framed it in terms of software. So then, if we're going to do that, then we need to then think about the consistency and precision of the setup in order to get to those conclusions. Because fundamentally, this is our problem, and this is then these sorts of system specifications are going to be the ones I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of minutes. So, if we think about what a reproducible pipeline is, and if you think about the kind of software that you've written for your problem, um, for your analysis, you might have something along the lines of, you might have the data that you've collected that describes your scientific question you want to answer. You will might have your dependencies, your hyperparameters, um, the scripts to run your jobs. You might have your analysis code, um, and you have the documentation to explain what you did. And oftentimes, this documentation may come in the paper, might come in a readme or something. But if anyone actually is, has dealt with these sorts of problems in real life, and I love this XQCD comic, um, this is a lot more complicated when you actually have to start working with other people's code. So who's actually had this problem where they try to run someone else's code and they get tied up just even getting things started? Okay, great. So this is, this is, a, this is like a fundamental problem that uh, I think is particularly important and, and what we're going to discuss more on. So, so I think dependencies are actually is an under, under emphasized problem in the reproducibility literature and is the one I'm going to focus on. So um, NeurIPS 2017 um, had released uh, code links in their schedule. Who's familiar with NeurIPS? Okay. NeurIPS is like a mainstream machine learning conference. Um, it's where people publish fundamental work in machine learning. Um, and at their conference, they included links to their papers um, and included links to where the authors 
said they would have put code in their camera ready. So I just crawled all of that. And so um, in 2017, everyone shared their paper who got a cat who got a presentation and um, you know, about like about 20%, 20 or 30% shared their paper, a little more shared their code, but among those people, most of those people shared their code on GitHub. And um, within the sciences, at least, um, this, this number is about the same. So within, um, this is a st study from um, Victoria Stodden and her colleagues, and that in, of 180 papers in the journal Science, 36.1% um, provided data and code when contacted. This is a study in which they were contacting authors to request code, and about 36 of those respondents ended up providing code. Uh, similarly, in the machine learning literature, um, only about 7% showed code. And so, again, going back to this, um, at least within the machine learning literature, people who are producing these algorithms that you're using for your research, um, or maybe you're building on Pond um, to do new novel algorithms, uh, of the people who do share code, the overwhelming majority of them are sharing this code on GitHub. Who's using GitHub right now to like publish their research? using other people's code. Okay, yeah, so I mean, I mean, you're all evidence of this as well, right? GitHub has now become a standard for open source. Uh, yeah, oh, we're about to get there, we're about to get there. We're about to get there. Okay, so I was able to find another 9% of these papers just by like snooping around through the actual links they provided. Like some people were providing like a link to the website instead of the actual code. So if we, we keep going down the, the the rabbit hole, we end up getting to an actual GitHub repository. So now that we're in the universe of people who have shared their code on GitHub among these NeurIPS papers, an overwhelming majority of them were publishing GitHub repos in Python. So over half. Um, and if you look even then, like most of these libraries are like open languages, right? I mean, MATLAB is like a, is a number two, but even then that's like much lower than that. Jupyter Notebooks is considered a language. I don't consider Jupyter Notebooks a language, but GitHub does. Um, but yeah, but so if you hope, presumably some of those GitHub ones are also including Python. And then from there you have a number of languages that are also open source. Uh, again, like and there's an additional 44 repos that have at least some Python in the repository. Um, and so this sounds pretty good, as I mentioned, because at least now we're all in a universe in which everybody's sharing the code in the same place, most of them are using the same language, so that indicates that most people then at least know what to do with the code and what to do with how to run it. But of course, going back to this Python example, it's a lot harder than, than it sounds. So um, who's used Docker? Okay, great. Awesome, you're better than when I give this talk at like some machine learning communities because not everybody uses Docker. Um, so, uh, so then who's, who's familiar with Jupyter Repo to Docker? Okay, so <laughs> Repo to Docker, <laughs> it's fine, not taking it personally. Uh, Repo to Docker is an open sourcing project um, that I'm involved with that um, handles, who's actually written their own Docker file? Written, who's who's written their own Docker file? No. With doesn't I just, who has who has gone through the process of having a Docker file written? Okay, so that number is a lot smaller. So for you who have not raised their hands, and for those of you who did not enjoy the experience what, of that you described when raising your hand, this should make this easier. <laughs> That's repo to Docker. Repo to Docker is a tool that takes some standard configuration files like we see might be discussed in here and helps with the creation of a Docker image based on these configuration files. Um, and these configuration files then establish the environment and the environment is necessary to run this code. And so, um, repo to Docker, this is how it works. So you might find this repo on GitHub, you might have these like, you know, you have NumPy and Matplotlib, and you just like call repo to Docker with the name of the repo. And then magic happens, ta-da, and like, it just, it, it builds a Docker image. It's really cool. It's my baby, I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so then you like get the repo and then you build a 
And then there's like a Jupyter server. You can get back to the repo and you can run it. So then you get, yeah. So yeah, this is what I and other people maintain it, yeah. We will, we will get to that, yes. But short answer is yes, we'll get to that. Um, okay, package managers and other installation tools then like can make these sorts of dependency specifications and these sorts of issues like a lot easier to handle and like dealing with that sort of like environment dependency hell. Um, and so we inspect that these repositories for the provenance of these configuration files that reboot adopted in that system. So the, these are the kinds of who's used one of these files in the past? Who's used one of these files in the past? Who's written one of these files in the past? One of these. Anyone? Yeah. Oh, great. That's again. You're like you're pretty good. Like you're you're better than some of the, the top communities that I'm going to talk to. So these are the kinds of files. Like so, this is like the kinds of files used for pip or for conda or if you're going to use Julia, right? There's there's additional ones that have been added to this, but um, at least at the time that I published these results, um, like setup.py, right? You, this is what you use to create your own Python package. Um, but even then, like if you look, this is actually pretty rare. So at least in terms of Neurus 2017, most people were not publishing the dependencies of their libraries in a machine readable format. Um, and if they were, they were trying to use um, they were trying to use it such that they could install the repository as a Python library. And so again, someone got to the point early, like doing this is really easy. Most of you people actually know this, so you actually all know the the drive home point of this talk, which is to do conda export or pit freeze. But um, keep doing that, it's great, makes me happy. Um, but there's another tool called retro zip, but basically um, if you have those sorts of files, then you can build a Docker image automatically with repo to Docker, like you're good to go, like try it out, it's really great. Um, and so, one of the things that I think was like you kind of saw from the video we discussed earlier with um, the repo to Docker, like opening up a Jupyter notebook, um, is that avoiding dependency hell like allows us to build and serve this repository anywhere. And so, like this, because you then can build a Docker image and you can put it anywhere. And so, you're probably you're, many of you are familiar with Docker. Who's not familiar with Docker? Come on, show quick. Okay, so. I'm not necessarily a systems expert, but for like, but on a, on a lightweight description, Docker basically allows, like a, is a lightweight uh, virtual image of what you're working with. So it allows you to have your dependencies and whole environment set up, um, handled in a more lightweight way that allows you to then have much more control of your environment. And you can then have a lot of different kinds of uh, environments going on at the same time. And it makes it a lot easier to work. So, Ruby Docker has actually also been used in, the past in competitions and space lines. This is a um, musical genre classification competition. Um, Ruby Docker is used for that. That is a machine learning. Um, this is a machine learning competition um, that many people are using GPUs. So this is an example in which people are using uh, Ruby Docker with GPUs um, and for the submitting of competition images for independent evaluation. Um, this is who's used Binder. Who's familiar with Binder? Okay, Bind, uh, Binder um, uses repo to Docker to, um, as the underlining technology for these Docker images. So if we go to like, I have an example of Binder. Oh, I don't. Um, so if we go, I'm actually gonna like just go to Binder. Um, Binder, if you like, can you see this? Right, okay, so I'm gonna do, okay, can you all see this? I'm like filling out this form and it has a GitHub link. And if we look at the log, it like says, oh, it found already a built image of this image 
um, of this GitHub repository. So that's basically the repo to Docker part. And then it's launching a Jupyter server um, of this built image. So it should be going. I don't know, it might, it might hang a little while. It maintains a Docker registry of all of these images that it, it that ends up being added by different users of different Git repos. Uh, we have there's like compute from um, donated from like Google Cloud and then there's another organization from the oh, OVH is the other one. Is it launching? Yeah. Can I hear you? Oh, oh there it is. Okay, All right. So this is the analysis that we were discussing, All right? And I can run this remotely, All right? So I can. That's what it looks like. All right. So if you look, the so this can run on someone else's server, All right? Oh, this is not going. It broke. But now you know it's real, right? <laughs> like I can go to one that works. I'm, right, I can go to, let's see. So now it's like going through the whole process. So you can see what this kind of looks like. So we're cloning the repo and we're building the Docker image. Um, I can go find another one. Um, so this is another example. You're gonna block my laptop? So this is another. This is a paper. This is another machine learning paper from some colleagues of mine at Harvard, um, and this should also run. Um, but I'm just going to go back to all these things are building. Um, this is a this is a NERP paper of um, machine learning for jet images in high energy physics, um, and um, you can rerun someone else's analysis. This is their notebook with their analysis and with. Jupyter Lab, you can actually put everything together. So you can have the paper here, you can have the analysis, you can look at everything and you can run it on someone else's compute and you never have to install anything. You just have to start just running the notebook. And so now we've talked about dependencies and how like dealing with dependency hell and getting that out of the way then allows us to run the code. Um, and so I would like to then think about what, what, is we, what do we mean about having good analysis code? So um, in various venues, code submission is becoming more important. Um, who are submitting to like, ven like venues or journals or something that requires like a code availability statement or code submission right now? Okay, so like some people, it's becoming more common in machine learning. It's beginning to happen more and more. Um, and um, so if we look at, go back to NeurIPS, um, at least for, for NeurIPS as a conference, um, code submission is becoming more common. So if you look here, um, in tw even going to 2018, at least 2018 NeurIPS, 50% of papers had code. So they volunteered code, independently code was not required. Um, and at least in um, the machine learning literature, sharing code is associated with higher citations. Um, so we can see here the average number of citations is generally statistically higher, but again, like this does not control for the institution, the code quality, the URL, et cetera. So, you know, take it, take that conclusion with a grain of salt, but at least this is the direction at least that this might suggest. Um, and at the same time, you know, despite the fact that there's this recent interest, at least in the machine learning community, of publishing code, publishing code has been, as part of papers, has been something that we've, the scientific community has done for a while. Um, this is an example of um, who has done 
use a bunch of done some like Bayesian clustering libraries. Okay, who's worked with like latent Dirichlet allocation? Okay, one person. Okay, so this is a this is a cluster this is a clustering algorithm, um, Bayesian clustering algorithm um, that was published in around 2004. This is the one of the early implementations of it at the time. This was like a this is something that they that the author had published with their paper. So at least this is something people tend to do at least like at at some point. Um, it's not totally uncommon, but people do it. Um, and this actually was useful for the open source project I ended up working on um, for Bayesian parametric implementations um, in Python. So this is a colleague of mine um, who was taking using this code to better learn Bayesian on parametrics um, to do our implementations of that algorithm um, using modern uh, software engineering practices. And so this was the library that I worked on with my colleagues. Um, it's still available online um, in case you ever want to do any Bayesian non-parametric clustering, the algorithms are all available. But I mean, for the, so despite the fact that like machine learning researchers love thinking about state of the art, um, for many use cases, and I'm assuming for many of your use cases, state of the art isn't necessarily the primary thing you're considering when selecting an algorithm to use for your problem, right? So, So in this example, if we go back to this, this paper, uh, these, these models are all pre-trained models out of like TensorFlow or PyTorch libraries. So these are, these are standard implementations that have been, been like carefully engineered that people are using. Who's using like, like pre-implemented algorithms for their research right now? Who's not, who's not like rolling their own models? Yeah, I feel like most people are doing that. Like a lot of people are doing it for baselines these days, right? Um, in terms of like how people are using pre-trained models in the sciences, um, this is a paper for um, skin cancer detection. Uh, they used a pre-trained um, image classification model to uh, start the training of their image classification task for uh, for skin cancer, um, ended up publishing it in a medical journal, establishing really great baselines for automatic image classification for skin cancer. Um, and this has led the community then to take greater interest in uh, careful documentation of these pre-trained models. So this is a uh, paper uh, on, uh, on documenting pre-trained models for people who are using these models to understand how was this model trained, um, what data was it used, for this model, um, what's the model itself, such that practitioners have a better understanding of the implications of model choice. Uh, so then given the fact that a lot of us are using pre-trained models in machine learning uh, to do science, to make deployments, to um, use as baselines, how do we ensure the quality of these models that we end up publishing? So at least in terms of machine learning research, um, and outside of machine learning research, um, in professional software and in, um, uh, in open source software, these projects are often not bug free. Like if you go to GitHub right now, you will see a lot of bug reports for your favorite um, like deep learning framework or something like that. And so some examples of how this is affects the machine learning literature. Um, this is a this is a discussion from two authors on a uh, Bayesian paper that was doing some like um, sampling for computational genomics, and as you see, the author then realizes that there's a bug in their scientific code, uh, and this actually ended up resulting then in a paper on the testing of MCMC code. Um, and ultimately, then the authors had to retract the paper and then reissue the paper. Um, with um, their new results. This is the follow-up paper. Um, and this is a really great discussion of what um, the experience of having to go through retraction is ultimately like. Uh, similar, uh, similar findings have been found in um, the uh, machine learning literature. I think this is, a, this is an RL paper 
Um, and the authors note that this paper was inspired by a bug that was found in um, some co-author, some, not sorry, not co-authors, some uh, colleagues' code. Um, they ended up looking at their implementation and finding something um, was amiss with their analysis and ended up building off of it. So we think then about best practices for research code. Um, none of this is necessarily novel from a software engineering perspective, but I think it's something that we need to think about as scientists. So when you are publishing code, and I hope you all publish code associated with your papers, as, as a little reminder at least to think about how do we do testing? How do we, can we, can we include testing, include code review, um, doing good design, thinking about variable names, right? So like, you know, my var, no, no my var, like coming up with meaningful variable names. Even, you know, if we're thinking about like parameter names, like instead of doing like lambda, right? Maybe we need to really mean like something like this is the learning rate or something like that. Like have like variable names that really are expressive um, and be willing to refactor our code when necessary. So, to kind, of, to kind of put in a, a deeper example of this, this is an example of um, bugs in code in, um, the, in actual software that we end up using. This is a bug um, from a machine learning library for um, automatic differentiation. Who has used Autograd? Okay, so this is, this is, this is a common Autograd bug. Um, like a lot of the libraries we use every day for our research have bugs to begin with. Um, and in this case, like an auditor has noted that there's a bug um, or a, a, the user has noted that there's a bug, tries to fix the bug, and everybody's happy, right? And this is, happens every day, all the time, in like the open source community. But if we actually compare like this sort of discussion to what we saw in the sciences earlier, like having to find, go through, and improve upon a bug in science is a lot more involved, right? It's a lot more involved, it's a lot more challenging, and oftentimes there's a lot more trepidation involved. Whereas in this case, someone's finding a bug in an underlying library, which is important to know because ultimately, like we are, we are judging our conclusions based on the software. But still at the same time, like this is considered an improvement for the general community, right? It's relatively straightforward. Somebody finds the bug, somebody fixes the bug, like everybody benefits. But that's not necessarily the case in the sciences. If I find a problem with your analysis or if, I think that there's something that could be improved. Like going through the whole process of a retraction is very, is, has a lot of trepidation. So one of the things I kind of want to, to leave you all thinking about is like, how do we bring the sciences close to this sort of model, right? Where incremental improvements and collaboration is considered a positive, right? And I don't necessarily have an answer, but I like, I kind of leave this to you as both, you know, something to be aware of in the sense that like your underlying software does have bugs. Um, and like your libraries that you work with have bugs, but also um, to think about how do we foster that kind of environment in our own scientific research. So yeah, this is kind of, this is basically one thing that I don't necessarily have an answer for, but I kind of want to leave you all thinking about a little bit. So we've kind of talked about, we've talked about the dependencies, we've talked about writing good software, um, and hopefully, you know, these pieces like give you a lot to think about in terms of implementing your own models and doing your anal analysis, but maybe that's not necessarily enough to ensure the reproducibility of our own research. And so um, I'd like to now think about what we mean when we think about uh, scripts to run jobs on similar hardware. Sounds pretty straightforward, but it's actually a little more complicated than that. So this is, uh, this is an example of a uh, computer in the library. Uh, I think this is the computer library in like South Bay. It's a really good library. It's a I mean, really good uh, museum. And this is like AlphaGo, right? Or this is the game of Go. And so we know that like, like, ha like a lot of compute is used for a lot of machine learning uh, research these days. It's very computationally expensive. It's very energy intensive. Um, and so a lot of these results may not necessarily be reproducible for the average user or for the average researcher, right? Like uh, Facebook recently published a re-implementation of AlphaGo and AlphaZero, um, but 
they're one of the few institutions that have the computational resources to ensure that their implementation works. And so this is the Alpha Open Go. Um, this, and this is the re-implementation that they have. It's available to the public. Um, but again, like, you know, this is, this, this works. We have results that suggest the works and they've, but it would be very computationally expensive for someone to take that and to run it for themselves. And so this really, so AlphaGo in the sense might not necessarily be reproducible simply because it's prohibitive, right, to, to pay that kind of money to get those similar results. And so unless you're a systems researcher, many of these details in the implementation of how they manage to get these, these um, large scale GPU farms to work together, to like pass gradients together, to like coordinate such that they can do distributed training and achieve superhuman performance in Go is not necessarily the important thing you need, what you really want to know is the underlying ideas of the algorithm that allow it to work. Um, and so, similar problem, Who's, who, does, who does neuroscience? Okay, so good. So that's, at least then I don't have to assume that someone knows this library better than me. I don't necessarily use this library, but this is a, this is a study of um, and the results of an open source library for, I think, brain volume measurements. Um, and uh, this looks at what the effects of these, uh, this library's performance on um, neuro uh, brain data um, with respect to system setup. And it sounds like relatively straightforward. You would think that results would be relatively consistent, but it's not. So the, clear, the main finding that they find is that users are discouraged from updating their releases or operating systems, or switching to a type of workstation without doing over the analysis. So if you change anything, you need to redo it again. I, I, to me, that's very scary. To me, that's absolutely frightening, that you would, might end up making dramatically different conclusions based on how your setup is designed, right? And so these are types of decisions and details that many researchers don't even necessarily consider. We talk about saying like, okay, you need NumPy, right? But how many people actually specify the actual version number of NumPy they're using, right? How many people are specifying the actual like underlying like type of WAS they're using, right? Are they using WAS? Are they using MPAL? Which version of that are they using, right? What operating system version they're using? Not necessarily everybody includes those details. Yep. So, this, so with regards to machine learning, that's not necessarily like, you can unit test like your implementation, but given a lot of these details, you can't necessarily unit test like the result, right? It really depends. I mean, ultimately, like yes, you if you have a unit test that might that might work for that case, but you still need to be very very particular about the environmental setup of what you're running. And even then, when you're doing like when you're doing something with a distributed system, it's not necessarily certain that the distributed system is going to end up giving you consistent results um, across machines, right? Because like this, one of the things that they matter here is that they discuss here is workstations. So if you're running this on a distributed system and you're not necessarily hitting the same machines, you might not necessarily get the same result. Yes, although one of the things that we, we don't necessarily have a, a, a full handle on given the fact that these implementations are non-deterministic is what our fault tolerance really is. Yes, but even but but we can get into that. That like even that is is problematic. I mean, we'll we'll discuss there. But even that is like when we get into the realm of like of uh, like non non deterministic methods. Like even that can get into get pretty hairy. So another challenge, even when we get to this part of discussing the actual type of workstation, the actual kind of setup, um, is even just like. When you try to be as neurotic as possible, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is reproducible for all time. So this is a paper in fluid dynamics. Um, Lorena Barba does a lot of really great work on open science. I would definitely read all of her stuff. She's doing a lot of stuff also on like um, alternative scholarship models, and um, she's really involved in sci-fi. Been to the sci-fi conference? Yeah. Lorena Barba is awesome. Read more Lorena Barba. Um, anyway, so she finds that um, even with really careful protocols within her own research group, um, she is unable to 
reproduce her results from previous years simply because of changes in hardware and changes in underlying software. So she does a lot of stuff with the GPUs for fluid dynamics and finds that because of the changes in hardware that occur over like a five year period and changes in CUDA, like you can't get the same results. And that you have to work very, very hard to get consistent results with the sorts of changes in, in software and hardware that occur over time. So even then, when we think about reproducibility, this is this, we need to think about it then with regards to some narrow band of time, given the fact that like changes in hardware and software are going to happen. I mean, I think that they were able to like, they were able to get similar results, but it took a lot of additional effort. I mean, it is a consistent problem. We, I don't necessarily have a solution and it's really hard to pin these sorts of things down. This is an example of a change in operating systems library and hardware setup of the same implementation using the same seed, right? Um, and they find that a deterministic implementation in the Lucy group for some learning produces different results. So, well, Docker will not, so at least when I talk about with people, so I was talking with some, some maintainers at Singularity, of Singularity and they find that even like because of, because of how Docker is set up, like you can't necessarily, like, because you, you have, when you were working with the GPU, you have to like get out of the GPU in order to like hit the GPU. Like, sorry, you have to get out of Docker to hit the GPU. You're not gonna necessarily ensure that as a result. And so like multi-GPU with a Docker might not work. And also different yeah. Yeah, so this is, so what I guess what I'm trying to argue is that all of this is fundamentally very fun. And then, you know, when we think about that, these sorts of concerns, like, it might not even necessarily make sense to make all our research fully transparent. So many of you have probably, who've worked with sensitive data? Like data that you can't, there, there are certain concerns with sharing either legally, ethically, you've had to get an IRB, something. Yeah, right. And so, so one of the concerns with regards to sharing these sorts of reproducible pipelines is the data itself. Right, and so this is a this is an example of the reproducibility of the machine learning for healthcare literature. As a healthcare researcher, this is something I care about, and um, the reproducibility of machine learning for healthcare tends to be uh, like less like less strong. Um, and one of these issues, of course, is the data itself. Um, this is an example of people trying to do very transparent research on data that is probably not the right choice to do in terms of transparent research. This, these researchers ended up publishing all of their uh, data and results for OkCupid data, um, uh, collecting people's information off of OkCupid. Um, the, the public did not necessarily respond well to having all of people's per personal information aggregated and published online in a single place. Um, and when we think about data sharing and ethical considerations, um, this is, a, this is another example of um, work by Tim Gebru, who also did the model card paper um, and her colleagues, this is a different paper, um, on um, data sheets. So data sheets is a questionnaire um, that researchers are encouraged to fill out to describe not only like the full data provenance of like what was the data, how was it collected, why was it collected, et cetera, et cetera, but they have a whole section then also on legal and ethical considerations. And the example we have here is like facial images, right? And like there's a lot of ethical considerations with dealing with data about individuals. So we need to consider, for example, then data, at least when we think about what it means to be reproducible research. And maybe in some cases, it needs to be thought about more carefully. We want to talk about like alternative methods of how to deal with that. We, I'm happy to discuss like during the questions, but that's like definitely something that we need to be concerned with. Um, so going back to your question then about um, testing, I'm going to go back to talking about testing. So when we think about what science, the scientific method is, right, like ultimately the scientific method has to do with the testing of hypotheses, right? You form a hypothesis, you say, this is what I expect to happen. You identify all of the, the experimental controls that you want to control for, and then you test with relation to those controls, right? And so statistical testing has been a really old practice. This is probably, this is like the earliest statistical testing research I have found <coughs> from 1710, which is on the likelihood of the birth of baby males and baby females. And so they, the, the, the scientists, 
was looking at the statistical likelihood of <coughs> babies be born, born boys or girls and finds that um, through statistical testing and birth records data in Britain, they were able to establish that they were equally likely. And uh, under which they, this, they, they argued for divine provenance. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, divine, sorry, pro, not provid, provenance, providence, divine providence. Um, and so statistical testing is something that many of you probably use for in your own research, um, but it's something that has been underutilized in the machine learning literature. This is some of the work that's been done for um, machine learning statistical testing of multiple classifiers um, from 2006. This is, I think, it's one of the later works that was done, and, and follow-up work on this has not necessarily followed. Um, this is a paper on the reproducibility of RL uh, baselines, and they find that um, despite the fact that they tried to do various kinds of statistical testing, uh, this statistical testing for our reinforcement learning, at least, is not established right now in terms of best practices and in terms of, of uh, the theory to handle these sorts of problems. So additional work is at least done, need to be done, especially in RL, to create better statistical testing of the comparison of models. Uh, and so, you know, given the fact that I might be arguing that we should be doing statistical testing of our machine learning models, many of you probably are familiar with like problems around p-hacking, problems around um, cr creating statistical significance. And um, in other sciences, there are definitely methods for us to deal with these questions. And so who has done pre-registration for their research. Who's familiar with pre-registration? Okay, one, okay, one person. Um, so pre-registration is the registration of, a, of the plan of a study that is published in a particular database or venue prior to the analysis or the data being collected. So this is, a, this is an example of um, clinicaltrials.gov, which is a, one of the largest pre-registration uh, databases in the world. So um, clinical trials that occur in the U.S. are mandated to be registered um, online in this database, and it's available, searchable and available to the public. Um, and so this is an example of what this might look like. Um, who's, the, oh, who's used Open Science Framework or familiar with Open Science Framework? Okay, Open Science Framework is another database um, that allows for not only the coordination and maintenance of your own scientific studies, but also for the pre-registration of studies so that you have all of this available prior to doing your analysis, such that you have a very specific plan of what you wanna do, and then you just have to go off and do it. That way that um, everybody has agreed to the analysis and whether or not it's, it's statistically significant, then you at least know after the fact so that you, you come up with a dis distinct plan of what you want to do and then you go off and do it, rather than the, doing it the other way around, which often leads to concerns around p-hacking. So in the scientific literature, at least in other studies, outside, other fields outside of machine learning, uh, they have found that pre-registration then leads to the publication of negative results. Uh, lack of negative results can be very problematic and challenging to a lot of fields, in that then we don't necessarily what doesn't know what doesn't work. Um, and they have found that um, that, uh, rep, that registered reports, which is basically the model that allows for the publication of peer-reviewed pre-registered studies, such that publication then is independent of significance. Right, so you, you register a study, it's peer-reviewed, and then based on the quality of your analysis plan and the quality of your methodology, it is then um, sent off for, pub for publication. That's just saying, okay, you get, yes, you can publish this, you know, come back with your results. That's, this is at least, this is what we call the registered reports model. We find then that negative results are much more likely to be published in these sorts of models, at least based on this literature from um, the psychology and social science community. But when we think about machine learning research, at least, it might be a little bit different when we think about pre-registration, right? For machine learning literature, you don't necessarily have to collect novel data. In many of your problems, you already have the data on hand as well, right? So then what do we think about, how would we then do pre-registration in our own fields, right? In our fields, maybe many of you have not done registered reports. Is there an opportunity for us as scientists to adopt registered reports in our own communities. 
So one example, one alternative method of thinking about registered reports is to do registration at the time of review. So in this scenario, we might say, I'm going to describe my model, describe my analysis, describe my plan, and then the actual running of the code will be done by an independent body, an independent agent, right? And those results are the ones that are published, right? Just saying, this could be done, not saying it, it hasn't been done by anywhere, but this is, an, this is an example of what we could end up doing, right? Instead, so that we, we, pub, we publish what we want to do, we publish the whole setup, and then somebody else runs it. Yes? So, so at least in the machine learning community, a lot, number of, um, a number of research groups and sponsors have cloud companies. So for example, like, um, so for example, like there's, um, like some of the main sponsors of machine learning research are Amazon research, Amazon, Google is a, is a huge funder of machine learning research, Microsoft as well, they all have cloud services, right? And so we can imagine a scenario in which, or even like universities have their own compute. We can imagine, for example, that like the, pub, the public, the submission of the Docker image is the is the registration and then someone else takes that and then runs it right and that those results then are done by someone else is the results that are published yes and that, what i'm arguing is like you could imagine doing the results like with doing the whole experiment on your own to say like this is i i think this method looks good and i want to submit this but then someone else runs it. To, but yes, but the but the results from the independent run are the ones that are published, not your results, right? You can imagine that this could be a possible scenario. Um, and so so maybe, but of course, like these these experiments might be too computationally simple um, for us to think about in terms of like um, like what we could be doing with like registering these sorts of studies. And so um, an example then of like at least in terms of like the computationally simple examples of like the um, social sciences of registered reports in, in the clinical trials, these sorts of things. Maybe these examples that I've given of registered reports and of statistical testing is probably too, too computationally simple. So at least let's talk then about like how would we do statistical testing and um, controlled experiments in another domain. Um, and I'm not necessarily the expert with regards to high energy physics, but I think at least in other domains of experimental science, um, controlled experiments then are better, um, are better defined and thinking about like, how do we think about uh, testing a system we don't understand and designing systems to be tested is better, uh, like is, I think better like described. And so I think this is part of the reason why Rahimi and Rex identify physics as a possible area for us to, to consider for uh, the testing of black box behaviors and models and thinking about how do we do testing in general. And so um, I think there are a few high energy physicists here who know this problem better than me. So I apologize for like, for describing high energy physics not necessarily well, but an example of what you might think about in terms of high energy physics is like there's, there's multiple institutions that are able to validate each other's work and confirm each other's work, right? And so we can imagine then for the registration, somebody else might handle this sort of thing for statistical testing or for registration at time of review, right? Because they share computation, they share hardware and they share resources, right? And so in this example, this is, this is the Large Hadron Collider. And so these, so people can then share resources in terms of compute and for registration and for validation of studies, right? And even in this example, right, we have the, the high energy physics community has a better understanding of um, the things that they want to, to test for and the things they want to control, right? In machine learning community, we don't necessarily have these clear definitions, right? We think we just want to establish state of the art, but we aren't necessarily careful of trying to control for all these other experimental factors, right? And we don't necessarily know how to test for these experimental factors. And so this is something that we think we need to develop better methods and tools for. And so, as I mentioned, um, higher energy physicists are interested in the discovery of new particles. Um, and um, when they think about these sorts of questions, then um, they think about the, the thing that they want to test and the nuisance parameters they want to control for, right? And so 
one of the things that I would like you all to think about then in doing these sorts of tests and doing these sorts of experiments for your own problems is how do you establish statistical controls for your machine learning model such that you can make a strong conclusion that the thing that you're trying to find is, is present independent of all these other experimental variables that you might want to be doing. Right? So maybe this means you might have to run your analysis a lot more times with a lot more variability in terms of your system setup in order to have these sorts of things being confirmed. Right? And even though the, one of the questions that I'm, I'm interested in leaving to, leaving to you all to think about in terms of how you do statistical testing and how do we develop better statistical tests, I think that's a really important question for us all to consider as we're moving towards more deep learning models. So if we were to borrow this practice, um, one of the th I, you many of you are probably familiar with how you do how you do hypothesis testing in your fields, like. Um, but at least for machine learning, we don't necessarily think about how to formulate hypotheses, right? But at least in machine learning, one of the things we're interested in is thinking about the expected behavior, um, whether or while out some sort of experimental change in our, our model setup, right? And um, trying to record outcomes. Um, with regards to various uh, baseline models and considering this sort of variability. Um, and then we might want to be able to then think about some sort of statistical improvement and make some sort of assumptions about what those might look like. So this is some work that I uh, recently presented with Michaela, who's in the room. The poster is kind of fun. I really like this poster. Um, and so, um, one, so as I mentioned, like, being able to establish these sorts of systems level distinctions um, and get them independent of data, independent of um, our other experimental selections is really important. And I think that this is something that the machine learning community at least is beginning to start to adapt. Um, I assume that many of your other fields uh, think about these sorts of questions in a, in a deep way. Um, but I know that this is something that machine learning is beginning to wrap its arms around. Um, and at least I'm interested in talking to all of you about how you are working on those problems with regards to bringing machine learning into your fields and thinking about experimental testing um, and experimental controls given black box models, because this is something that at least the machine learning community hasn't fully dealt with and come up with good practices to deal with these sorts of questions. So one of these problems, the, some of the problems that we think about in terms of statistical controls, controls in machine learning is compute. And so, as, you know, obviously, like compute is a challenge, but being able to control for the, the, the con finding a result and controlling for compute, we don't necessarily know how to do. Uh, controlling for the random seed, being able to establish um, the actual systems, random seeds between machines is still hard. So being able to say that, like, your result is, is independent of your seed selection, you probably will have it to run in a lot more and among, on more machines in order to establish that your result is consistent um, regardless of what machine and what random seeds you ended up picking. But I think all of these sorts of concerns about the verifiability and the consistency of the results um, belies a more fundamental point, which is, is these verification and assertions really what we want? Are we, are we really just trying to do all of this such that we can like catch other people, right? Is, is, is not being, is, is just ensuring that our colleagues aren't wrong and they're not lying to us is what we're trying to do. And I agree that's not, it's not, that's not the point, right? We're not running other people's code just to confirm that they did their job right. What oftentimes we're actually trying to use other people's code because we have a problem that for ourselves that we're trying to solve. We're not just going off and trying to hunt other people down, like trying to shame them, right? And so fundamentally, I think ultimately the purpose of having code is to illustrate the problems and the findings that you're trying to do, right? Ultimately, we're trying to show what we're doing. We're trying to show our ideas as opposed to telling them. And that's, that's the benefit of code is that it provides us tools that express the ideas that we're trying to, to convey. And so when it, regards, when it comes to showing then, like, are these implementation details in the paper the main thing that we're looking for, right? And I argue they're not, right? Like, it's actually the most important ideas in the paper are not like what 
operating system you used or like what version of NumPy. Like all of this is important, but that's not the main point, right? The main point or the underlying ideas um, that you're trying to explain or the underlying findings that you're trying to communicate. And so this is a paper on um, the reproducibility and on computational science that is often cited. Um, and it makes this very radical claim that I think is actually still radical today, uh, which is that scholarship itself in computational science is not the paper. The paper is just a description of the idea. The actual scholarship, and this is, this is from like 95, so this is an old idea, even, but even still, it hasn't necessarily been fully realized. The actual scholarship is the software that produced that result. If you're doing computational science, like the actual deliverable of your finding is your code, right? Your code got you that result, that's your scholarship, right? And so these implementation details will be in your code. They don't necessarily need to be in those pap your paper, right? And hopefully then we can then build software that helps people do their own research that helps them understand problems by enabling them to use that code as opposed to just be focusing on these details of how to get the code to even run. And so maybe this means then that we need to be communicating with each other outside of this PDF. Many of you are using GitHub, many of you are uh, interacting with each other on GitHub. Like code is becoming a fundamental, open source code is becoming a fundamental part of how we're doing science today. And so we can start moving science towards this sort of model in which open source becomes a greater part of how scholarship is shared. And so I think one of the things that is important in terms of thinking about what we're doing then is that we need transparency in what we're doing, but we need, uh, we need ultimately, we still need them to be independently verified. So an example of what we might be thinking about then is like simple implementations. So this is AlphaGo Zero, um, and this is an example that uses tic-tac-toe, right? This, this implement, this like has the model of Alpha Zero, right? Which allows general purpose um, training of models for uh, two-player games, um, but it also includes tic-tac-toe. And tic-tac-toe is actually much more useful to the average um, scientist because it can run on your own machine, it doesn't cost as much money, and it has all of the implementation details of the algorithm, right? So we can run the whole thing on our own and we can even put it on a different game, right? We can say, what would it do if we ended up playing Othello, for example, right? And so we can, we can really interact with this algorithm in a meaningful way. Other examples are uh, notebooks. Who's familiar with distill.pub? Right. So yeah, this is, so distill.pub is a venue that allows for um, explanatory science um, in machine learning literature. And this is an example of um, differentiable parameterizations. Um, and all of these are collaboratory notebooks that communicate the ideas that are presented in this paper. Right. And so any of these, note, any of these examples then can be independently run and interacted with in the cloud. Right. So uh, collaboratory allows people to um, run a GPU. Um, on Google Cloud, and they can interact with this so that they can run the notebook, but also can ask their own questions. This is an example of a paper we discussed earlier, which is Attention is All You Need, um, which I mentioned established um, the fact that uh, implementation uh, improvements in NLP don't necessarily have um, consistent results. Um, and so as a result, this is, this is available online in a notebook. You can just go through it and see an independent implementation and work through it on your own. And so to go back to what I mentioned earlier with the notebook, um, a lot of you have used notebooks in the past. Um, many of us use notebooks not necessarily to present science, but just to interact with a, a piece of data, right? So in this example, someone's using IPython. Um, they're trying to plot the data they're trying to load the data, right? And so oftentimes when we're trying to think about a problem, we often interact with it computationally, right? We just want to be able to see what happens and, and begin to ask our own questions independently, right? And so what I'd like you all to think about is through open implementations and like really good implementations, we begin, can begin to immediately build off of other people's code. So this is an example of um, 
a research repository on Binder. And in this example, um, they're doing some machine learning for explainability and for interpretability, and they are presenting their analysis on the left. This is their notebook, right? Um, but because I have the code and because I am able to run everything independently, I can now ask my own questions about their analysis automatically and immediately. So in this example, right, they have like, this is their experiment, they have it set up, right? Pretty straightforward. But here I can actually now go through their examples and like look through their data independently. I don't have to like figure out how to, to load it to the creating simulated data. I can check through their data on my own. I can ask my own questions of their data. But more importantly, they're using this example of like creating the simulated data with four classes, right? I am now able to say, but what if you did this experiment with five classes, how would it perform, right? And I can create my own simulated data and run this novel experiment to ask my own independent questions of their model, of their method, without having to do any additional implementation work because it's all there, right? If this were if this were another repo that was not necessarily as well maintained, if I didn't have this sort of setup ready to go, this would have taken me a lot more work, right? Just getting to this point of saying, well, what if you did this experiment this way, right? I'm sure many of you as uh, have gotten reviews in which they said, well, why did you do this experiment this way? Why didn't you do it that way? How many have gotten that response? <laughs> The nice thing then with this sort of scenario is that you can then push it back to the reviewer or push it back to your colleagues and let them do that for themselves. They can then ask their own questions independently of you running them, right? Which means then that everybody can build off of each other's work immediately because all of these pieces are together. The analysis, the code, the computation, all of these pieces are together such that we can immediately start building off of each other. Right, and this is, this is one of the benefits that open source has allowed, is that people can then build off of each other code immediately because we have code that runs. And so I think to, I, I'm, I've taken a lot more time than I wish I did. I think I wanna give more time for questions, so please stop me anywhere. Um, but I think ultimately, like in this discussion around reproducibility, I've identified a lot of challenges. I've identified a lot of like practices that I think could be improved. But fundamentally, I think more importantly, we need to think about what we really mean by the term reproduce, right? And that's part of the reason why I'm not particularly interested in what the definition of reproducibility is. Because ultimately, what I'm really interested in is the question of how would we get research to be get better research, right? And that's ultimately what the purpose of science is. The purpose of science is to create knowledge such that other people are empowered to ask new questions based on that knowledge. And so, Oftentimes then we would call this an extension of previous work. And so fundamentally that means that I'm interested in the question of um, how do we build extensible science? How do we build extensible computational pipelines such that other people can immediately build off of what we do and ensure that the community of researchers around a particular question grows? And so this is, this, is the, this is the same data set that I discussed earlier, which was the NeurIPS 2017 data set. And we were talking about citations, we were talking about research practices with regards to dependency setup. Um, but some of the things that I wanted to point out here um, is um, when we look at people who include dependency files, right, files that can actually identif identify what software was used in the machine-made readable format, we find that people who are publishing these details have more engagement on GitHub, right? And so this is, these are the average numbers of four star gazers and watchers. Many of you are familiar with these sorts of metrics in GitHub, um, but I think the one that I really wanna highlight is the forks. Um, forking, who's familiar with forking a repo in GitHub? Okay, so you all know what that means, right? So when you fork a repo, that probably means you're gonna use it to your own purposes. Right, you could, you could be using it just to like make a pull request, which is great, like, but you also could be using it to repurpose the repo for your own problem, right? And we find then that like notably more people are repurposing these repositories for their own problem using these machine learning algorithms, right? And so that then means that the people are applying these, repo, these methods to their own problem at a higher rate because they can, they can install the dependencies, 
And so um, I think last year I uh, was with some colleagues at J Project Jupyter and we presented a implementation of Binder that included GPUs. So we took a bunch of repos um, of machine learning algorithms that were available on GitHub um, and we uh, ensured that they were able to be uh, put on Binder um, and run with a GPU so that you could just log on and get like a, a one GPU to yourself to re-implement the, to rerun the analysis. Um, and so it can be done. If you have any more questions about how to work with repo to Docker and uh, GPUs, please stop and find me. Um, but that's, but the, this, the, but having a sort of place in which independent running of uh, repositories, I think it's particularly important and notable to think about. Um, I would love to talk about this with you more. And I think I'm gonna get, take questions from here. I don't know if I have much time left, um, but if you wanna learn more, these are some, some citations of the kinds of things I've been thinking about, so. So I think one of the things that I'm really interested in, and I think this is one of the things I was like kind of pointing out with this slide, is like, I think that machine learning, one of the challenges in the focus for state of the art is that there is, there is a less developed community for empirical research that tries to understand the behavior of machine learning models. Now this is something that I'm working on and it's a really important question. Um, I think that um, drawing attention to that in the community and trying to develop that as a field is like a really important problem. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm interested in working on, but I think it's, it still hasn't been quite as established. Um, we ha there's interesting work that's been done in theory to try to understand how machine learning models work today, how over-parameterized models um, might be able to learn despite the fact that they're over-parameterized. Um, but in terms of empiricism, I think it's still very, it's, I think it's a still a very young field and it still is something that needs to be developed. Um, but like at the same time, we've found that there has been work in this even earlier prior to like the, the popularity of deep learning, but it, it still is not in a place in which like it's a fully developed field. So my hope is at least that by bringing attention to these sorts of questions, we can attract more researchers to be doing these sorts of problems um, and to be working on this sort of thing. So there are workshops that try to do, like, like there's a ICCV, uh, which is a computer vision workshop um, that is interested in um, a pre-registration model. So that's an example of one thing that might be for that. There's a recent workshop I went to at ICML, which is on understanding phenomena and deep learning. But it's still a young field, and I think that um, bringing along the community such that people know how to review these sorts of papers and people know how to reward this kind of work is still an ongoing process. Does that help? Did that answer your question? I mean, to me, I think it's. I think the. I think to me, it goes back to the venues. I think ultimately, like the venues define what the unit of scholarship is. The ven venues describe define what the method of evaluation is. The venues define like you know like what a good paper is and how to re reward good work. Um, so to me, I think fundamentally, we need to be like going to our communities and like arguing for research that values software. So there's interesting work in terms of like, there's journals, like there's the Journal of Open Source Software. Um, I'm going, you know, Lorena Barba is doing a lot of work in terms of that. Like there's like SciPy, which has proceedings. Like there are these venues that are coming up that are doing these sorts of work and like code availability is becoming like a thing for certain venues, but at the same time, they aren't creating like established methods for peer, for peer review of code, right? So that is something that we need to do. Um, but fundamentally, I think like, like you, we could try to talk to our research community, like our, our departments and like have those sorts of conversations about funding. But I think like, to me, like ultimately, if I give a Docker image, if you tell me to submit a Docker image that spits out a PDF, right? versus like give you a PDF, like, like I feel like if the, you know, if the place gets the PDF, like they still get the PDF. So like if we can move towards that, then that would be better. Um, but I mean, it is, it, is a, it is a challenge, right? And so like, I, and I've been to conferences that like think about scientific scholarship. Um, and I think, the, I think the journals are still trying to figure that out, but they're also having a lot of challenges. I mean, in my mind, like if we're thinking about like what people would pay for, in terms of scholarship. I think people would pay for, for hosting and compute 
of, of like someone else's research, right? If somebody put up like, if somebody put up a, 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 a cloud system in which like everybody was publishing their research and like they would pay to run it for you, I think people would pay for that. That's just my belief. I don't, you don't have any evidence for it, but like if you're, you know, if you're a journal somewhere, if any of you run journals or editors, like, you know, I think this would be a way you could make money, but <laughs> you know, yeah. But I think this is part of the challenge with this is that the, the, you were expecting people to do duplicative effort. What I'm arguing fundamentally is that there's like, is that if the code is the scholarship, then maybe we need to be publishing, publishing the code and re requiring review of the code and like publishing of the code in that way. Like, you know, well-documented code also is documentation, right? In the same way that like a paper is documentation. And if there's a way that we can like remove that duplicative effort and like venues can move towards that, like I think that would be really great. Um, like there's really interesting work done in certain research groups that do like websites for their papers. And many of you have probably, who's read like the medium post of a paper first? Right, like there's, there's a lot of really interesting, who's like, who's like read a summary of a paper on Twitter? <laughs> right, there's a lot of really interesting forms of like alternative scholarship that are becoming more rewarded even if it's not explicitly, implicitly. I know researchers who have had like details and like discussion points from their like Twitter discussion or their medium discussion posted, like, like, like used as the thing that's cited when it's not in the paper. And so like, I think that given the fact that like how we're talking about science and how we're doing science is like already changing outside of these, these venues, like, like my, hope is is that like as all of us continue in our research careers that we start thinking about how to bring those two back together how do we bring that in how do we like like honor that sort of alternate form of like scientific communication and like bring that in like formalize that because like a lot of you are spending a lot of time like talking about science on twitter and like promoting your work on twitter and like communicating it and if there's a way that we can do that in a better way such that we can like connect these to code that would be really great but it's like it's hard. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of these are ultimately open problems that are ultimately social problems and not technical problems. I think, <laughs> so this is, this, this, this is, this is a social, social talk, social, socio-technical talk more than I think it technically might seem to be. Yeah. <laughs>